This podcast has been brought to you by Voyager's World. We are building the most amazing hospitality network. Please visit our website, join us for free, and start participating. I have my friend Rob Piper here, and uh, Rob, I want you to uh, please say hi to our listeners and to our viewers, and tell us, give us a one-minute uh, uh, summary of, of uh, who you are. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Rob, Rob Piper. Uh, yes, uh, I'm an American. I was born here. Uh, I was raised in town Woodbridge, Virginia. It's about 30 minutes south of Washington, D.C. Um, and then pretty much my life has been pretty much consistently. Uh, I went to school uh, up in uh, Penn State, and then I joined the military. Uh, then I'm um, very, very close to retiring from the military. And that's pretty much, well, that's pretty much it on the, at least on the work side, the type of things I like to do, I like traveling, which is uh, kind of how like uh, uh, me and uh, me and uh, me and Milton met. Uh, well, we actually met through the, uh, the the little social social group called Hashing. We're like uh, both hashers, and uh, and for those of you who don't know what Hashing is, that's the drinking club with a running problem. Internationally well known. Check out our Wikipedia page. Uh, and then, uh, in addition, uh, you know, I'm looking to do the. Uh, I'm getting doing some off-duty education as well, hoping to uh, finish my master's degree by the end of this year, and then try to get into a PhD program. And uh, that's the big thing. Uh, I'm an avid kickball player uh, because that is one of the few sports where middle-aged guys like myself can uh, can still uh, can still have a good time and and uh, not get seriously injured. So. You mentioned hashing, and that is actually how we met. Uh, and we, uh, this is going to be the first podcast where we talk a lot. We, you know, we, I, I really put on the agenda. I need to explain to people what is hashing. Uh, and and I'll, I'll try to give a very simple explanation here. And I'll put the links on the video to you know to some resources where people can read more about that. So hashing basically is a is a is a drinking club, you know. It's a drinking club of people that like uh, running. Uh, they like running, or they at least like the idea. Not every hasher is a runner. A lot of them just walk with us, but at least they are sympathetic to the idea of going out outdoors and 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 walking or running and having a good time uh, outside. And then, and we are, we generally we love beer. Most most hashers are are enthusiastic beer drinkers, and so we have a few beers, and then uh, one or two or more, just and then <laughs> yeah, and then just is we call that hydrating, right? We are just prehydrate. <laughs> then then uh, we run a bit or walk. And some people uh, then either we, we run from bar to bar or, or we set up a trail. Someone runs first and, and lays the trail with us, puts marks. It's really a funny process. I don't want to describe the process itself in detail because most of the fun is to discover how it works. And so when you go the first time, it, it, it can be a mind-blowing experience because you discover that something so simple can be so much fun. Um, but then, and then at the end, we drink a little more, and then that, uh, we do some celebration, and that is also done in a very particular and friendly way that, that I don't want to, that I also don't want to describe. Uh, but, but it's really cool. And to me, those, those two things, the way that the run is done and the way that we celebrate at the end were what made me feel that this is my tribe, this, you know, this is a group that I love to participate. And, and it's a community of some, probably more than 2 million people. I, at the last time that I saw any credible uh, uh, statistic about, or, or estimate about it, was that there are more than 2 million hashers in the world, uh, which means you can find hashers in any major city, 
like Miami. <laughs> uh, any major city and also around any major military installations uh, of English or Americans. Uh, also, uh, any place that has, for whatever reason, significant uh, uh, consular presence. Uh, a lot of people in consular service are hashers. And, and I discovered that in special events, hashers also show up and organize uh, or disorganize. Uh, like, for example, there is a group that runs at Burning Man. Uh, uh, you find hashers uh, along most, uh, most major uh, uh, marathons or, or events like Ragnar or runs across the country. You know, there usually there will be some, some hashers. Uh, uh, for good or bad, <laughs> they will be there. <laughs> they will be bringing their beers and having a great time. Uh, so hashing is amazing. Uh, we have we also have uh, certain traditions, like we have hash names. Uh, for the hashers watching this, my name is S on the rocks. And Rob, what's your name? My name is Private Snowball. Okay. Well, that is that is always a good story behind why. We have such names, which is also part of the, you know, the what makes hashing so much fun. And I'm not going to ask you to tell the story right here. This is a, this can be even more fun in person. Uh, so uh, we, there is always some something funny that, that they wait until you do something really stupid or really funny, which for most of us didn't take that long. And then, and then based on that, they give us a name. So it's, it's, it's funny. I end up with S on the rocks. Um, but how did you find hashing? Uh, it was the, I was made to come by a hasher, a Harriet named Incoming. Incoming. And where was that? This was in Washington, D.C. Okay. You were living in Washington for quite a while, right? Yeah, five years. Okay. Uh, were you in the military already? Yes. Okay. So you're a Marine, right? I am. I am. What brought you into that? I like to ask because apparently it's something so evident. You know, oh yeah, he decided to get into the military. But very often I discover that is an interesting story behind that. You know, and, and what happened that made you, made you decide to do that instead of being a truck driver or a bouncer or a rock star? Uh, you want the long version or the short version? <laughs> the short one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, guess, uh, I guess it was mainly uh, uh, two reasons. One, I didn't have a lot of money after college and I needed a job. Uh, two, I really loved the uniforms. Oh, my God. The Marines look so damn cool in their uniforms. And what can I say? If, if they were going to let me wear one for 20 years, I figured I'd take them up on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, there are a lot of people today. Uh, uh, that may be listening to us considering getting into the military or not. Uh, mm. Some of them because they think, well, you know, I need college, you know, uh, and I cannot pay for it. And, and I always argue that if you're getting to the military just because you need money for college, it's not a good idea. You know, I don't think that should be the main, the main, uh, and, and also if you, if you don't have any other option, you're probably a little dumb and college is not going to help, but that's, that's half a joke and half true. You definitely have to know what you're getting into. I mean, you have to like, uh, not mind serving, which is essentially, I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're in service. Uh, so if you're like, I mean, me, I, I do enjoy serving other people. Uh, you know, that, that's why I like throwing parties a lot. That's why I like herring trails a lot. Uh, and yes, I will, yeah, you got to know what you're getting into because yeah, there will be times when your patience will be tested frequently. Uh, so yeah, it's like you say, yeah, you definitely, um, it's, if, if you are just going in there just for college, uh, you definitely have to like know what you're getting into. Yes, you will get, you, you will get your education paid for, but yeah, you're, you gotta like, you gotta make a decision. Yeah. Is it something that you want to do with, you know, three or four years of your life? There are certain aspects of military life that I often advocate that people in, in the civilian world should have that education. It should be part of, of high school somehow, uh, or it should be part of the education you get from your parents. And, and one of those aspects is 
is that when you are in a in a in a structure uh, like a military structure for sure it's inevitable that occasionally you you are going to realize that the guy above you on the in the totem pole that he's an idiot you know uh, you realize that you're getting orders from an imbecile and and it's not going to help to bitch about it you know it's there is no way that it's going to help you have to get the thing done anyway you have to move forward and, and this is an attitude that i noticed that all my military friends have they don't stop and bitch about it they they keep going they move they 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 realize all right maybe i can solve this another time but right now this is this is the problem that i need to deal with you know and and you know when and and when you get into uh difficult situations like uh when you travel or or when that is an emergency uh you'll be very happy to have some military guys around you because you know when the car gets stuck in the mud they don't they don't keep looking at it bitching about it they will be searching for a way to get that situation solved so that automatic drive to work on this problem and get out of it get out of this uh that drive is something that is a it is a learned skill uh, i don't think anybody is born that way you know it's it's a learnable skill oh i mean i certainly wasn't yeah i mean it's it's yeah it it was it was drilled into me you know my problem solving skills my uh my uh my decisiveness my action oriented uh, stuff yeah that was developed yes uh, uh i i felt that even uh hashing sometimes you 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 you're you lay a trail, you set up, you know, the, what you believe that should happen, and then the hashers don't follow it, or they cannot find your trail. <laughs> that was a problem, you know? And, yep. and you need to, if, if, you, if you get negative at that moment, the entire hashing experience is going to turn kind of boring. Um, <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot bitch about it. You have to find a solution, and you have to make fun of it, you know? But... But in, in, in not just in hashing, in everything. I ride a motorcycle, you know, in you know for years, and and sometimes you know you have a problem, and you can sit down on the side of the road and feel bad for yourself, or you can work on the problem. That you know that you only have two options there, um, and it, it always works out. But you need that attitude. Um, Another another characteristic is that it tends to be easy to communicate because uh, you guys learn uh, also in, in police and and pretty much any any force or any organization where people use radios and do a lot of communication that is only audio. Uh, they follow certain standards. So if I tell you that something is on the right side of the house, you know which side it is. You know, while a civilian may not know it. You know, if I tell you that oh this thing is 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 one mile east of some place you are used to think of things in terms of east west north south uh which i noticed that outside of america uh it's not that common uh here you say to someone oh the bar is just a, a half a mile north of this station and people have no clue what you're talking about and and, and i find that quite surprising uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's our fault. That's 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 Americans' fault. We need to get on the metric system. Yeah, no, but it's not the problem. Is not that they, they they didn't understand the half a mile. The problem is that they didn't understand north. Oh, okay. that is what is what is surprising me, especially in Europe. They are used to think of sides. You know, they say uh, it's on the right side or it's on the on the river side. They talk a lot of that in in those terms. Oh, it's on the riverside, or it's towards, you know, towards this neighborhood. They say, oh, towards the city. You know, you say, oh, one kilometer towards the city. But if you, if you say, oh, it's, it's one kilometer north, it seems to me that the percentage of people that will understand it is going to be significantly lower. Uh, so, um, I don't know, uh, we need, uh, and every time I'm talking to my, to a lot of my biker friends and hashing friends are, are, are ex-military or, or active military. And, and, I, and I just tell them, or, or sometimes I'm saying something and because of, uh, they listen with an accent when I talk, uh, sometimes they don't understand me. 
and then and then I just I just say, oh, uh, what is that? That oh, it's Charlie Alpha Delta Lima, and, you know, and I, I just go with the codes and they get it right away. Mm -hmm. Uh, this would be a very good skill for <laughs> for civilians. Uh, yeah. Uh, an, an, another is um, a certain tolerance to discomfort, which is, is something people really need. Uh, some days it's colder. Some days the food is not good. If you're traveling some days, you don't find food. So that day you don't eat. And when I tell people, well, you know, I'm thinking of running from here to there and it's going to take a week. They say, well, you know, what about food? I say, well, when we find, we eat. When we don't find, we don't. You know, and, and apparently their brains melt when you talk like that because they, they, they cannot conceive the idea of not guaranteeing that you are going to have a meal every day or, or the beaching starts. You know, oh, but we need to bring this, we need to bring that. No, you don't need, you need to be there. <laughs> you know, to be there and solve the problem when it, when it happens. Uh, when, I, when I was uh, uh, doing my long distance runs, uh, most of the time I couldn't carry enough food for the next day or a or, or, or few days. And I had to, to, to believe that either I will find and uh, food to buy or someone will give me or or somehow i'll be able to 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 to, to arrange that or i just won't eat you <laughs> know that's okay that was amazing what you did <laughs> but people in general they should build up a certain tolerance for discomfort uh sometimes I, i'm in kiev right now and sometimes i tell people oh let's go to this bar it's some place like this and they say, oh, but it's so cold today. And I'm going out, it's too cold. And I feel like, motherfucker, you're in Kiev. You're not in Miami. It's going to be cold half of the year. If you don't go out because it's cold, you're fucked. Okay, you, 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 you can't think like that. Or they say, oh, uh, or, or you suggest something. Oh, this is outside of this metro station. They say, but that metro station is so far. Yeah, but you don't need to run it. <laughs> you are in a you are inside a subway car. <laughs> there is no effort in this. If that place is three stations away or eleven stations away, the effort is the same. It's just five more minutes. <laughs> you know? Uh, so people I guess people like are not used to getting out of their comfort zone. Or sometimes, you know, you you're getting out of the you no know, the, 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 the train, you need to walk one kilometer one mile whatever it is i i am exactly one kilometer from the metro station here sometimes i get out of the station i get out of the station and it's it's raining you know it doesn't occur to me to not go you know i just put the hoodie on and go get wet you know <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah. It's just something that you do that day. You know, it's, it's, it's not something important. You cannot give too much importance. Someday it's too cold. Yeah, I'll be, it will feel cold. It will be uncomfortable. But you have to accept a certain level of occasional discomfort, which most people are never willing to do. Now, is that, like, uh, is that kind of indicative of like, like most of the people and where you're at? Or is that just like the, uh, just a few people? I'm curious. It's across the board. It's all over the world. In America, it's the same. In Brazil, it's the same. In Europe, no, it's, it's, a universal, it's a universal level of laziness that a certain percentage of people have. But that percentage is not too small. And, and what I notice is that when you, when you are dealing with athletes... Uh, especially athletes that are used to, to be outdoors, you know, like runners, like, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, triathletes. It doesn't occur to them to not go out on a run just because it's cold, you know. They don't work out because it's comfortable, you know. Right. Um, and when you deal with the military, it's the same, you know. You say, well, you, we have to carry this stuff over there. And it's fucking rainy and tough, and you know it's 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 late, or or we are tired, or we are drunk, or what doesn't matter. It gets it gets done. 
It's like, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the, the mission is what exactly. the mission is, and it must be accomplished. Exactly. It gets done. And then when we, then when we finish, yeah, we may bitch about it. Yeah. But we only bitch about it after it's done. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, that's beautiful. You know, you can trust that. Uh, uh, another thing is, is that uh, you are used to, to be on time. You know, when you say, uh, okay, we'll do this on Sunday at uh, 9 a.m. for you, right? Uh, 10 a.m. 10 a.m., yeah. So we said, okay, it's going to be Sunday, 10 a.m. I knew, I really, I really believed that I was not going to get a message from you today saying, oh, man, I party too much yesterday, I can't make it, you know? There wouldn't be something lame, you know? If, if, if there was a message from you asking, asking to delay it, it would be for, for some really, you know, really good reason. So, so it, it doesn't mean that you never fail at doing something or never delay, but it would never be something lame, you know. And, and I have friends that, that, that I noticed that. I can tell them, okay, we are going to meet August 27 at 8 a.m. in the middle of this place where there is nothing else there, right? So and I don't even need to confirm. I just go there and they will be there exactly at that time, you know. And if there is, there is going to be any change, they'll let me know, you know. So I, I, I like that, that uh, trustworthiness. Um, it is something important. Makes life easy. Makes everything else easy, right? Uh, uh, it's one of those things that doesn't have a lot of value on itself, but it helps everything else, you know. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, those are the, the uh, to me, the three main characteristics of, of that military people usually have. Um, and, of course, there are some other things that I don't like, but, but I like to call attention to this. Uh, you said that you traveled a lot. Where have you been? Uh, so I've been to Japan, uh, Philippines. Thailand, Taiwan, China. I mean, yeah, I, I was stationed in Asia, so it was real easy to get to a lot of Asian countries. Uh, I haven't been to many places in Europe, though, so I'm working on that. But I have been to Belgium, uh, London. Uh, actually, was at, I was in London over the holiday, actually. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I've been to Turkey, but, you know, I was pretty much stayed on the military base over there. And I've, I've been to just about – I haven't been to every state in the United States, but I've been uh, through mo to, to most of them. Uh, I have, I have, I have yet to, I haven't seen Alaska yet. I would like to see Alaska. That'd be pretty cool. And, uh, uh, and yeah, all the, I've, I've been to all the cool states. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Florida, Virginia, uh -huh. Texas, New York, California, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the, the fun states. Uh, what about Colorado? <laughs> I, I drove, uh, I would, yes, I was in Colorado. Uh, I hashed with the uh, folks with the uh, Pikes Peak. So, yeah, and that, that, is, that is a beautiful, beautiful state uh, because it's kind of like it's, it's, it's really flat, but, you can, but there's, there's mountains, and you can see the mountains. The mountains are so huge. No matter where you're at in the city, you can see them. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing arriving in Denver if you're coming from the east because it's flat, 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 flat until you are in Denver. But you are looking at the mountains right in front of you, so you so the city is exactly on the edge, and and you can and you know that after after Denver it's going to be, you know like uh, that those beautiful mountains all the way across. It's it's gorgeous. Even when you're in Denver and it's flat, you're still pretty high up because just try like you know I went I went for a run uh, in there uh, when I was in Colorado. Oh, I was, I was tired after about maybe. Five minutes. I felt that in El Paso. It was a, a you know the usual Tuesday run, and not much of a distance. And that was right after. It was right after I came back to Florida from one of my runs, and like just two months later, I was still in great shape, and 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 I and I was doing the El Paso run, and after like maybe two or three miles, I was feeling beat up. Uh, and I arrived late, so they gave me, you know, they made some fun of me and called me, you know, the that fucking last. Um, so, but 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 then I, I I checked the altimeter and I thought, oh, that's why, you know, this place is this place is so high. 
Um, so hashing, tell me, tell me something more about hashing. What, what happened to you lately that is interesting? What's, well, the most interesting thing that happened to me that I could think of, apart from hashing with the folks in London, uh, with the, the, the Brits, you know, they, they, the British, British folks invented hashing, by the way. Yes. So it was fun to like hang out with those guys. Uh, but uh, before that, um, I actually did a little, a little hash event, one of my own personal hash events that I do every year where I like, I set up a bunch of trails in a row. So that's uh, like like you mentioned before, the hair lays the trail. Well, I, I I every year I do that in a different city, and I do that like uh, five to seven times uh, over five to seven days. And I did that in, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so yeah, that was my uh, that was that was my my interesting thing, my interesting hash event for the year. Uh, so and then uh, can I plug some things? Uh, I live in South Florida. Uh, we're like about a we're a family of about uh, six six to seven kennels. Uh, kennels, those are our chapters, uh, our little our little our little hash groups all over the world. We call them kennels because they're filled with dogs, hounds. So yes, uh, there's about seven kennels down here. We're gonna have like a, we're gonna do a little event where like we all get together and we're gonna call it a tour de hash. You know, kind of taking off of the play on the word Tour de France, well, this is a Tour de Hash, where, like, the, uh, you hash seven trails. You do seven trails over seven days, every day for seven days straight. So, yeah, that's, that is, that's in the works. Uh, all us kennels getting together and planning it out. So we're putting it out there for, like, international consumption. Uh, if you want to visit Miami or visit South Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Key West, Miami, if you want to visit that, that'd be a good way to uh, to get indoctrinated into the world of uh, South Florida hashing. Yeah, um, I'm going to um, uh, to put some links on the video, uh, uh, links to to the kennels, links on how to contact, uh, how to find hashers, uh, and I'm posting some uh, some things about that at at Voyagers World. Um, and I'll put links to, to me and you so people can contact us and we will even help them uh, find, you know, uh, find a, a group or a kennel uh, that is near them so they can join in and, and discover, you know, discover what it is. Uh, I, brought, I brought in a lot of people in, into hashing. I bet you did the same. Uh yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's kind of been so many. Heck, I I know I've told a lot of people about it. Uh, a lot of the people that I work with, yeah, I, I tell them about it. I guess the uh, and I just uh, I kind of throw it out there and see if they show up. So yeah, it's it's been a lot. I, I have a T-shirt that says I I I hash on the first date uh, because <laughs> I I really believe that it's a very good idea if you meet someone. And you are considering that you are going to spend, you know, any significant time with that person. Bring, bring her or him to to the hash, you know, yeah. because you see how they are going to to act when there is a lot of fun, that is running, that is drinking, that is a little bit of 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 nice, good humor, but. Uh, it's, it is a little bit of pressure. Sometimes the people are going to make fun of them. They need to make fun of everybody else, you know. So if they don't have a solid sense of humor, they are probably yeah. not going to, to like it. And, and let me tell you to our viewers right now, if you really like serious running, but you don't have much of a sense of humor, don't try. Forget it. It's not, it's not going to be for you, right? So if you are not really into... Uh, you know, uh, an environment where people are drinking and making fun of it. Um, so if you don't have a very good, you know, very strong sense of humor, then it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. If you're very socially conservative, uh, probably won't be for you either. No, no, yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and, and, and to me, it's a very natural filter. You bring the person, you see how they, they you know, how they act when people are, you know, around them and drinking and, 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 and singing and going crazy. And, and it's, it's such a good indication of, you know, how that person is going to behave anywhere else. It's like when you give them a computer with very slow internet. You learn so much about their, their personality <laughs> right there. <laughs> you know, slow internet and hashing.
you know that's the, that's the test <laughs> well yeah well if you're if if, if you uh, if you have an alpha personality mm -hmm. you'll probably have a good time yeah yeah you'll probably do <laughs> uh this one time <laughs> we like uh we were in um key west and uh this was a the the tour to snowball thing, the tour that the the, the, the tour that I did in 2014, and we ended up in uh, the the final day was at was in Key West, and yeah, it was uh, it was something that had never been done before a a tri hashathon where we rode bikes, we swam, and we also ran. So and yeah, and that was uh, shaping up to be a really good thing until uh, we got to wound up in the middle of a monsoon at the end, uh, pretty much South Florida, South Florida rain. It comes unexpectedly and it, it hits you pretty, pretty, pretty hard. So uh, I pretty much, uh, but yeah, uh, we, so it was kind of like watching a uh, wet t-shirt contest because <laughs> we definitely didn't run. We definitely didn't run away from the rain because there was nowhere to run anyway. But so we just got out there and, and we did our, uh, we, we had our, like our end ceremony uh, under like about, uh, I say pretty. Uh, I'd say probably about a good twenty inches of rain. That was that was that was crazy. Uh, uh, I remember uh, once uh, uh, hashing the Everglades, and people decide to to cross a channel into the Everglades. It's either on the way in or the way back, and there were there were alligators around, and and we and 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 the hashers were looking at the alligators. And the alligators were looking at the hashers, but you know, a bunch of hashers together look very scary for the alligators. <laughs> so, so the alligators kept the distance, you know. But imagine how many jokes people made about it. You know, I always, I always choosing someone to point at and say, "Hey, you know, you stay behind. You know, you take care of the alligator." <laughs> or I remember finding, uh, go, uh, going through the woods and and. And especially when I lay trail, I tend to to make sure that I notice where are the spider webs. You know, there are a lot of big spider webs, and they are not they are not venomous at all. You know, that is no they don't pose any danger. Uh, but I make sure that the trail goes through some of those. You know, because it freaks out some people, and or we run through you know, through cornfields, and <laughs> and sometimes I. And laying trail and choosing a place that is really muddy and or they have to crawl under a bridge or something and I'm I'm there thinking like <laughs> really enjoying it. <laughs> Imagine they'll have to go through that shit. Well yeah, that's part of the fun of like uh, laying laying the trails. It's like how much can you how how much how much pain can you inflict on the on the on the pack? <laughs> so Yeah, and when you go uh uh, it, that that is an incredible similarity with hunting, with a natural hunting. You know, like uh, imagine that uh, you are out there in the savanna and you you know you need to you need to hunt something. Uh, first of all, you don't know how long the hunt will take, right? It can be one hour, it can be five. Uh, it may fail as well. You may come back hungry, right? It's the same yeah. with the, the hashing. Uh, we don't know how long it is, you know, and we don't know in which direction it's going to go. So you will discover as you go. So yeah. you bring and and, and 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 you don't know exactly how much or what will be the reward. If you don't know, you don't know if you will finish in a bar or if you will finish with one beer or or if you are not going to find it. Um, so he, I think that it brings some of those primal uh, feelings that we have from our evolution as, as hunters, as hunters and, and as runners. Um, also, we, it's, it's, it's not a competitive thing. It doesn't make any sense to compete. You have to cooperate, just like in hunting. In hunting, the pack has to cooperate. And they have to work, they, they will work in different capacities, they will have different roles, but everybody is helping each yeah. other, you know. There is no, no point in, in finishing a hash run without everybody. And, and I even see that uh, in some places, because of the style of trail that they do, 
if they run the risk of leaving people behind along the way, someone gets a car and goes back and finds them, you know? Yeah. Or, or, or many times I did already get to the end of it, but then run back to find, you know, someone that, that stayed behind. Uh, so there is no point in competing. You know, it's not a, even though we, we, we brag as if we, we were competing, but, but there is no point in it, you know? Well, so it's, the only competitive it's, thing about it is, you know, it's like, can you out drink the other guy? That's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the competition. Exactly. Uh, which is a competition that you have no, like me, I have no intention of winning because I know I'm a very light drinker, but I, I, I like the, you know, the, the, the joking and fun, but I really like that it's not competitive, you know? It's something that we do for the fun of it, um, yeah. And, and just and it brings up all the tribal, the good tribal behaviors that that we evolved with. You know, we didn't we didn't get to the point that we are by competing with each other. We did that by helping each other, by having oh, yeah. fun together, by by grouping around a fire and telling stories. You know, and drinking together and dancing together. So that that all that tribal behavior is present in in hashing, in 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 in, mo- in a modern form. But it's a tribal thing. Yeah, that's a very yeah, that's a very interesting uh, insight. Because yeah, I mean, you'll notice. I mean, there's a there's a lot of there's herd mentality. If you like go to a hash and the run is finished, and after the uh, and everybody's gathering around for the for the circle. I mean, yeah, you'll notice. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's like a lot of like uh, uh, herd tendencies. In Miami, one of the last times that I that I lay trail there, I was waiting at the end with the beer, and and I could hear the hashers at a distance, and it, it was dark already. I was near the the the, the railroad tracks, in. Uh, you know, when you're close uh, west uh, in North Miami, where there used to be the immigration building, well, the building's there, but it's not immigration anymore. On 71st or so, there is that big building, and, and there are the railroad tracks. So I was waiting by the tracks, and, and the pack was coming from a distance, and I could see them going in one direction and then another because I put some false signs just to fuck them. And, and then... So I, I saw them running one direction, then running the other direction and, and, and coming back. And then they found the trail and they were running towards me. And the moment that you hear the, 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 the yelling and the running and the laughing and, you know, and all that, the feeling that I had was that this is my tribe. You know, they, I, I had that happiness that, you know, that, that is a very tribal feeling that this is my tribe. And for a guy like me that doesn't live with his family, that is separated from his family all his life, uh, it feels like that's my family. You know that that that's the peop- Those are the people that are closer to me. You know, so the the feeling is amazing. So it it keeps keeps me coming back. And also when I travel, uh, uh, travel by running or by motorcycle, the the hashers are an incredible source of support. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of convincing to get a bunch of hashers to come to the road and meet you and bring some beers and have fun, you know. And, and I found I found a lot of support in 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 many cities. The El Paso, for example, was so important to me that I end up coming back like several times just to visit them. And to the point that once, once someone asked me uh, how many times I was there, and it was already like fourth or fifth time, and I said, wow, you really like El Paso, don't you? I said, no, not at all. <laughs> this, this city is a hole in the desert. Why would I care? <laughs> it just happens that I have a lot of friends there, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's a lot. It's not just two or three. It's, it's dozens of great people that, that I connected with, so I feel compelled to visit them, you know, same with Houston, where they, they also, you know, I, I made a, a lot of great friends there, uh, uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, Panama City was amazing. Panama City was the first kennel that I met when, I, when someone told me about, about hashing. I was, appro- I was approaching Panama City and 
So when I got there, you no, know, they helped me. They 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 got me a place to stay and you know and kept me you know kept me drunk all the way to Pensacola. Actually, uh, between between uh, uh, I think it's Rosemary Beach and Destin, uh, some hashers ran with me. They, uh, we made twenty six miles that day running, and we went. On those 26 miles, we stopped at five different bars. So when we got to Destin, uh, we were down to two guys left standing. And we were so drunk. But it, it, it was to, the next day was going to be a, a day off for me. I was not going to run. And, and we were completely exhausted. But, you know, we made 26 miles. Basically talking, drinking, and having fun the entire day. And one of the few times in my life that I started drinking at 9 a.m. That was, that was surprising to me. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot drink all day if you don't start in the morning, right? Well, of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, that's the beauty of hashing. You, 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 get to, you get to move out of your comfort zone slowly but surely. So you, you do things. You, do, you get to do new things. You test new limits. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. So. Yeah. Uh, let's let's go back to kickball because I want to ask a question. Can you explain to people what the fuck is kickball? <laughs> sure. I mean, kickball kickball is is if you're familiar with baseball, uh, it's it's a combination of of baseball, soccer, and dodgeball. Uh, so we use we used a big rubber ball from dodgeball. Uh, we used uh, you have to kick it, so that's where soccer comes in. And the rules of kickball are pretty much, and the structure of kickball is just similar to uh, baseball. Uh, you have a home plate, you have uh, three bases and home plate, you have a pitcher, you have uh, fielders, and you have uh, outfielders, and you have a kicker and a catcher. And that's, that's it in a, in a, in a nutshell. Uh, there's a, a, an organization that's, that's it's an adult kickball where, where adults, people that are old enough to drink, can play kickball. And uh, this is like a world organization. It's called the World Adult Kickball Association. So, and, and it has it has leagues all over the world, mostly in the United States, a, a lot in Florida, but it's mostly uh, it's. But there there are leagues all over the uh, all over the world. That sounds interesting. Well, uh, it, it's is it known uh, in, in mostly in America because it's so similar to baseball, which which is. You know, a pretty much a just a, an American or North American sport, because uh, okay. baseball out outside of Cuba, Puerto Rico, U.S., you know, maybe Canada, very people, very few people care about it. Well, yeah, it's it's most mostly American. Uh, what it is, and where there are Americans in other countries, yeah, that's where they have the leagues. Uh, but it's it's it basically in America, it starts out as a as as an American kid, a playground, a playground game. Where like kids, uh, grade school kids during recess, you know, they, they will play this game. So that's that's pretty much where, where Americans learned it initially as children. Uh, but then I'd say back in the 90s, there were four guys or three guys in northern northern Virginia that wanted to find a way to to meet to meet women. So <laughs> They they started this thing, so they uh, they they started a league. They started an organization where adults can play kickball, and then after the kickball game, they can go to the bars and drink. So it's pretty much like you know, uh, you, you, like you, Ashen. <laughs> pretty much like Ashen. Yes, there are lots of similarities. Lots of similarities. Uh, yeah, the only difference is, you know, most of the people who play kickball, they they find it very very hard to run and drink at the same time. They prefer to like do the physical activity first, then get drunk. Whereas hashers, you know, <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> we, we don't with beer in our hand. We don't get. We don't care. <laughs> uh, more than once, I had like a beginner go to the hash and drink some beers and then try to run, and <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, you you end up you end up holding end up holding her by the ponytail while she's throwing up. You know, it's not it's not <laughs> a great idea. So I, I now I tell people, you know, if you're not used to this, don't drink before. <laughs> don't get, drink too much. Yeah, yeah, maybe get, get, yeah wait to drink later because it's not going to go very well. <laughs> but uh, it, it's it's funny when you said that. Okay, the guys start this, you know, as a as a way to and you know to get to meet a woman. 
Well, that's that's that's, that's what I say. I mean, they. I guess the the official is the the official uh, phrase is yeah. They 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 wanted to find a way to build to expand their network and meet other people. No, but it's funny when you look at uh, uh, Facebook. Facebook started, you know, as a way to you know to meet the girls and you know and match their profiles. You know, the, the guys were nerds; they couldn't get to the nice parties at Harvard, and they started yeah. that to see where it where it could go. You know, in what direction it could go. Um, it worked, um, but a lot of businesses I know I I, I have occasionally conversations uh, like I would say sincere conversations with athletes and and business people and and when you really dig into what was the motivation to start something uh a lot of it is yeah i wanted to find a way to socialize or make money so i wouldn't be you know alone in my apartment anymore you know many times it was a way to go out you know, and meet women or, or for girls and to go out and meet men, which, which brings me to the theory that if sex was easy to get, uh, then, then the economy would fail. You know, if you, could, <laughs> if you could just meet people and say, hi, hey, I know you from high school. Oh, yeah, I remember you. And then you just, you know, you just, just, just fuck. You know, if it was that easy, then nothing would get built. You know, nobody would work, nobody would save money, nobody would get a more expensive car, <laughs> you know, nobody would be... be killing each other either. There'd be no killing, there'd be no serial killers, there'd be no mass shootings. Probably no war as well, because, you know, it, 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 if sex is easy, it eliminates the, the, the motivation to do a lot of the, the, the uh, a lot of what is economical economically significant you know uh, and that includes war right but most of most of what is economically significant is based on you know uh, I need to do something otherwise I never get laid and and, and then uh, all right I'll open a big business you know I'll open this or I'll I'll develop this thing or I'm going to you know I'm going to run a, you know a marathon in less than three hours you know whatever it is that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. That would make a really good thesis topic. <laughs> yes. It's like, you know, <laughs> what would it be like people had sex more often? No, yeah, I, I think that the first, the first guy that I saw come up with this theory was, was Doug Stanhope. And he said in one of his, one of his comedy shows that uh, the only reason that cocaine is illegal is that it makes uh, sex too easy to get. And and if people, yeah, and, and, and that if you if you if you have any means to pay for it, then you don't work. It, 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 it destroys productivity, you know, because why are you going to work and save money and buy a better car and put a spoiler on your Honda Civic, you know, and, and work on all that, you know, all that process of courtship and then have the girlfriend and so many dates and all that, you know. If you can just, you know, be high with someone and there are no inhibitions and you end up fucking anyway, you go in that route, right? So he said, you know, the, the, if, if sex is easy, nothing gets done. If I got sex, like, as often as I wanted, uh, I, I'd, probably, I'd probably quit my job because I'd maybe think to myself, you know, like, I'm having more fun doing this, so why don't I need all this? Paying bills. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the first podcast where two men are telling the truth in public. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ladies. Yes, that's why we. That's why us men fight wars. Yes. Yeah, that's why we fight wars. It's like you know, uh, George Carlin has a good line about it. He says it's the big dick theory in practice. <laughs> you know, someone says, "Oh, those guys over there, they have bigger dicks." What? Really? Bomb them. <laughs> That's how it is. It's people from two different nations arguing about who has the bigger dick. <laughs> that's a, that's and that's why, that's why the bombs, the bullets, and the rockets are shaped like, shaped like I, dicks. <laughs> According to Carlin, that was called fucking with people. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Well, I guess I mean, what did uh, what did Conan say? You know, destroy your enemies and uh, and, and r- watch them run to the lamentation of the women. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my God, that's that's all that is. You know, the economy, the wars, everything. It's all it all could be solved with you know, go out, have some drinks, run a little bit, sweat, and have fun. You know that. You know, you we we could save the world. No, we would save the world with this <laughs> we, we 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 are we are we are we are the world's last hope for diplomacy <laughs> Ashy. yes by the way i have um i have found of course i have found hashers uh, everywhere in, in europe and and i hash in several cities uh and and, uh, and but i have a I, okay let's do some bitching now i have one bitching to do about it let's see if you agree with me they don't respect the temperature the temperature of beer. They serve beer too warm, especially the English. Jesus Christ, you get to the hash and the beer is in a box. It's cold <laughs> over there. I mean, you know, it's no, uh but it's summer. You know they have summer here. You know, it lasts it lasts two weeks, but it, they have summer. Uh but so, so they serve warm beer in the summertime. They they serve warm beer. Or worse, check this out. Once I was okay. I'm not going to say where it is. Okay, it's a city. It's a city in, the, in Eastern Europe that I visited a bunch of times. <coughs> Look at us. Okay, uh, I'm not going to say where it is. Uh, and 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 I went there and we were hashing and they and, and they brought out this beer and it, the 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 snow was knee deep. Okay, it, 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 uh, the city was covering snow. And and they someone bought out the beer for you know for for uh, the after run and all that and and I said I'll just put the beer in, on the ice you know just leave it under a tree the beer will be perfect after you know half an hour when we get back the beer will be fine and and they said ah yeah 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 and then later I mentioned again hey don't forget to put the beer on the ice <laughs> under the tree ah oh, yeah da da yeah yeah yeah. Well, they left the beer inside the car. And inside the car, that was the wife of one of the, the organizers there. So she had the car on all the time with the heat on. So we, at the end, we were surrounded by snow. And all the beer was warm. And, and I was thinking, what kind of human being can do such a thing? You know? And in most places, like it was like that in Netherlands. Netherlands warm beer. You know, they put it on a bag on a hot day. They put it on a bag, you know, be- behind the bushes. Okay, it wasn't a shade. In their opinion, it was cold. They said, no, this is cold. I said, no, by cold, I mean colder. Yeah, ice this. cold. Yeah, ice yeah. Cold. You know, can't you buy a bag of ice and put it in, you know, and let it, okay, it will be acceptable, right? Um, yeah, I would, I would expect other, that. Yeah, in several other cities. Now, in in Paris and and in in Brussels, the beer was perfect. Uh, they they brought big coolers and they put a lot of enough ice or enough of those ice packs. Uh, so you know it was fine. Um, but but not everywhere. And what I noticed that even here, you know, people buy people buy a beer. They put that you know in their backpack and carry for two hours and then they offer it to you you touch the can it feels like it just came out of the shelf from the supermarket not the cold shelf the other shelf you know and i and finding ice in europe is a project okay in most most houses they don't even have ice trays you know in the fridge you know not a lot of people have a nice any kind of ice maker uh, and in most gas stations in Europe, they don't sell ice. Uh, here in Ukraine, for example, you can only buy ice in supermarkets, in, in some supermarkets. And, and it's in small bags, very small packages, and it's very expensive. Uh, uh, in last time that I was in Czech Republic, I spent about an hour driving from market to market to market to gas stations everywhere and I gave up couldn't find ice 
uh, and that was for a party. I was bringing the beer, and I didn't want to bring, you know, the beer without ice. You know, gave up. So all right, uh, we will have to improvise. I'm surprised no one has filled that niche. But then again, maybe uh, maybe the Eastern Europeans maybe maybe they don't like their drinks too cold. No, Western Europeans too. Uh, uh, they, they, and especially if the hash is managed by English then I really get ready for a warm beer, you know, and I get ready for it to not drinking it. But, but the Belgians, you know, the, the, the French, they, they have a clue. Uh, the Germans respect their beer a little more. Uh, yeah, the, in Germany it was generally better. Um, but in Eastern Europe, uh, there are countries in Eastern Europe where they, they didn't even consider beer as alcoholic until recently, you know, until a few years back, it wa if beer was not on the same shelf with all the alcoholic things. It was in the shelf with the juices, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is yeah, they don't consider it alcoholic, you know. Maybe that explains it. Uh, yeah, it's, I guess they're not, they're not beer drinkers. They're, uh, I guess what, they, they, they like hard stuff. The liquors, yeah. You know, in America, sometimes we joke and say, wow, you, you know, you drink like a girl, you know. <laughs> but when a guy drinks a lot, I'll say, you drink like a girl, <laughs> like a Russian girl. Because <laughs> 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 people here drink, drink, they can do it. Oh, you mean when he, when, he, uh, when, when, he, when he drinks a lot of hard stuff? Yeah, they, they, are, they are professionals here. They, they, can, they can do a lot of it. <laughs> Also, so the Russian gals, I could like, you know, they'll, I could offer them like a, uh, I don't know, some a glass of, a glass of, uh, a glass of tequila, or I guess what kind of hard stuff do they like over there? They like uh, vodkas in in Poland. They like uh, flavor vodkas, which are delicious. It's it's a delicious thing. You know, they they, you can go to a bar and have you know very small glasses. If you want, but you can do like a series of let's say six or eight different kinds of vodka, and each one will have a very exquisite flavor that that you you will take your time enjoying it. You know the way that you would take your time enjoying a a good scotch. You know that you go slow. You're not you're not you know doing that as a shot. You are really sipping it and, and enjoying the amazing flavor. Um, I, I like that a lot. I don't like the shot culture <laughs> in general. Like in America, they buy a shot of something, whoop, you know. It doesn't make any sense. You're not tasting anything. I don't know. To me, drinks are to be tasted, you know. And if the idea is just to load the alcohol, you know, to get fucked up, which a lot of people like, I understand that, but I don't. I don't. Those are American. Yeah, we uh, we, yeah. we like to. Yeah, people like to it quick. Yeah, they they drink in quantity and they want to do it fast. I, I don't understand that. Or especially drinking a lot of crappy beer just to get, you know, shit faced. Uh, to me, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, we invented uh, Americans invented shot gutting. I don't I don't think no other culture on the planet does it. But yeah, shot. Years. Pro probably not. Uh, uh, to, to, to our well, this is an international audience, so please explain to people what it is to shotgun a beer. Oh, the shotgun a beer is to take a twelve ounce can of beer and drink it as fast as you can. Uh, you, you take the top off and you guzzle it as quickly as you can. Uh, if you are able to take a sharp object and puncture the side of the can, it makes the beer flow out that much faster. So yes, you can down twelve ounces of beer in approximately, uh, probably, two seconds. Some people have done it in less than a second. Yeah, I I, f I think that's about half a liter, uh, something like that. Twelve ounce. It's probably half a. Liter. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll convert later. I don't want to go to Google right now. Uh, but it's it's it, it, it's it's a lot of beer for just a few seconds. Uh, or they do the beer mile. Uh, you know, they, they run a mile drinking, it's four or five beers in a mile. Yes. It's, 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 uh, one lap, a uh, quarter of a mile, uh, one lap around a standard Olympic size track. And then at the end of each lap, you, you drink, uh, you, you chug one beer. Four beers. Uh, and it's four regular size cans, right? 
And yes. Exactly. So, and, and the record is around five minutes now, right? I, uh, probably. Running yeah, a mile. I, I wouldn't... Yeah, running a mile, drinking four beers in just five minutes. I cannot even just drink five, four beers in five minutes. Takes me longer <laughs> than that without even any other running. I cannot drink it that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is amazing. Uh, oh, yeah. There, there are some, sometimes beer miles still have like a, where the track is, is half the distance of a regular size track. So you're, you're doing eight, yeah. eight laps of beer per, per lap. Uh, I ran the, the 30 pack marathon in El, in, in El Paso. And let me explain to people. It's a, uh, they get a marathon distance and they, they divide that, they, they make great, make a loop that, that is 0.82 miles. So, which is about 1.2 kilometers. And so every loop you drink a beer. And so the idea is that on a full marathon, you are drinking 30 beers. Uh, sounds good in theory. <laughs> but, when, <laughs> but after, uh, and I could do it. I was in the best shape of my life. I could definitely run that marathon in less than six hours, maybe uh, probably close around five hours. I was never a fast runner. So five hours for me is a really good time for a marathon but but after 18 and, and it's a it's a it's a short loop it's it's just one kilometer and change but after 18 loops so after 18 beers i was getting lost i was making wrong turns and if you are taking a wrong turn on a short route that you did 18 times before that means you are really too drunk and and I and I felt that I had the energy to do it. I could definitely keep running a marathon or more, but uh, I thought I'll have an accident. You know, I'll run into a car, or you know, I'll I'll throw up, and I don't like throwing up. You know, so I went back. Uh, you know, I finished that loop, didn't have a beer, and start eating. <laughs> start eating very slowly, and and I didn't throw up, but it, it was brutal. It was brutal. I never drank so much in one day. And I saw a guy, there were some guys from the military that they were doing, they, they were doing IV shots. They were stopping and taking IV shots. What are those IV shots? You probably know it. What it is, they're just putting, they're just putting fluids back in their system. Uh, they're putting electrolytes back in their system. Uh, it, it's cheating. Because yeah, you you pretty much it's it's kind of like we didn't have a rule against it, so I guess it wasn't <laughs> shitty, you know, in a in a in a race where you can be incredibly shit faced on alcohol, saying that you cannot take an IV <laughs> because it's cheating, wouldn't make much sense. But but yeah, it, it was scary to watch, you know, because they were they would be shaking and and then they would go and keep running. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, yeah. They're 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 basically uh, putting uh, putting more. They're rehydrating themselves to counteract the effects of the beer. Yeah, and the guy that the only one guy finished the day that I did it, and and he was he was a soldier. He was an army guy. Don't remember his name right now, but he he finished the thing, finished his beer, he sit down, and there he stayed for the night. What, uh, what, uh, uh, where, where did this take place? That was in El Paso. Yeah. What, uh, what, what did he look like? Maybe I know him. <laughs> I know a couple of army guys that, that I hashed with in, in Okinawa. What do I say? He looked like a soldier. <laughs> he looks, <laughs> he was a, what, uh, uh, I can, I don't know. Uh, he's my friend on Facebook. I just cannot remember him, his, his name. Uh, and I cannot remember his hash name either right now. Oh, okay, no. Um, but, uh, I, yeah. all, probably, I probably met him. <laughs> yeah, you probably did. Uh, did you hash in El Paso? Uh, no, not in El Paso. I did. Uh, I hashed in Austin. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's another nice, nice hash. Uh, yeah. Oh, they were so I, cool to me. They were so, so cool. They went when I was running into Austin. They they were already running towards me, and they, they found me. In the beginning of the city, and they ran with me all the way in. We took a photo 
by the statue of uh, Steve Ray Vaughan because mm-hmm. I, I had to pay my respects to that great guitar player and and then we went to Hooters and, and <laughs> that, that's where we celebrated uh, and and they don't even like Hooters there for one reason or another but they did just because I asked for it and they you know they I guess they just want to be nice to me and and they were it was really cool really cool and the next yeah, day in the next two days uh, well I took the day off and then the next two days I was running and away from El Paso and they were driving and meeting me and bringing beers and bringing food and you know, so they would be driving like 20, 30, 40 miles away, you know, just to meet and, you know, and, and offer more help. Have you, have you been in combat or did they keep you in the kitchen all the time? No, I mean, the, when I, during the first invasion, the, <clears throat> we were like, I was embedded with the, uh, with the ground forces. So we went in there, we, we took fire a couple of times. And yeah, basically, you know, I was riding through the towns with like the rest of the convoys and, you know, and uh, pretty much had had my gun like ready, ready to pull out and shoot if necessary. But uh, yeah, it was it was actually a pretty uh, the, the initial ride in there <clears throat> was actually went went relatively smooth. So the uh, I, had, I didn't have a lot of close calls. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's when like the, the second year when, uh, yeah, it's, it's, they, they started, people started shooting back. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I missed that piece, you know, okay. fortunately. I saw some statistics at some point about the first invasion that had like, uh, that during, during that first campaign, like of the first 76, I think it was the first 100 people that died, uh, uh, the first 100 Americans that died. 76 died in traffic accidents, you know, in the convoys, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's I, I guess they go fast and they are loaded and, you know, with, you know, heavy, heavy vehicles. And it's apparently it's relatively easy to have an accident. Yeah. 76 were not even combat where they were in transport. Exactly. They, were, they weren't combat related. Uh, they, were, they, they were accidents. Even in the U.S., just in training, it's something like 200 guys a year die in training. And that's because the training is so realistic. It's so on the edge. It's trying to, you know, to get them as close as possible to, you know, to the feeling of being there for real. That sometimes they're there for real. <laughs> Usually it's because uh, people, yeah, people, they get complacent. Uh, they get so used to routines that they that they get careless and yeah that's 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 where yeah they're they're safety mishaps essentially uh, somebody getting shot because they didn't know like the weapon was loaded or you know somebody like uh, turning uh, over to rolling a vehicle over and then getting uh, getting killed in that regard uh, so yeah or or falling asleep behind the wheel yeah because it's interesting you mentioned that the uh, the uh, the soldier was falling asleep uh, yeah that that happens a lot uh, you know this they. The uh, the soldiers or Marines, still they, they get too exhausted, and then you know, and they're so exhausted that they they have lapses in judgment, and that in turn puts them in a bad situation. I I imagine that. Um, by the way, did you ever run overnight, like Rag, Ra- yeah, Ragnar or something like that? No, no, I I have yet to do uh, the Ragnar relays. I mean, the the closest thing I've done to a long distance run, I I just did the Marine Corps Marathon in in 1995, and that was it. I did uh, well. I did Ragnar, but Ragnar is not totally overnight. You each participant ends up doing one segment overnight, which is you. Let's say it will be somewhere between four and twelve miles, but it's one shot. And then you can sleep before or after that. You can take uh, uh, a little bit of time to sleep in the van or or in, in the in the <laughs> any park bench will be good enough. Uh, so you can sleep a little bit, and the next day you do one more segment. With uh, in my case, it was a short one, like a five mile. Uh, it felt difficult because it was the third one, and I didn't sleep much. But it's okay. You do it. Uh, but once I decide to do 
uh, you were probably in Miami when I announced that I was going to do a overnight hash. So we had a few beers in South Beach, and then we were running to Hollywood uh, to make a 26 mile run. We ended up doing 24. Uh, we felt that it, it, we were too sluggish at the end, we were too bad. And, and what I noticed is that uh, we even didn't drink much in the beginning. We had just one beer and went. Uh, and we tried to, you know, to, to keep a nice, good pace. But doing that overnight was too, <coughs> too brutal. Um, I feel that the, the, the effects of not sleeping are so much worse than the effects of distance. Like I can, you know, if you sleep well and then you do a marathon, you can do it okay. But if you spend all day awake, you know, and then without sleeping, be, being already a little deprived, then you start a marathon, you know, it's it's not easy to, to finish at all. Um, and that's how I dropped off uh, of uh, that one, like with two miles to go. But I thought, fuck it, I was... I was I was running and sleeping, um, which uh, uh, I think, as far as I remember, it's the first time that it happened to me that I felt as I fell asleep while running. So I was running and I closed my eyes to relax it a little bit, and then after <laughs> some point I woke up and I thought, "Oh shit! I just had a, a tiny dream." <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not good. Micro sleeps. Yeah. Uh, no, and I and I, and, uh, I read the book. Um, uh, Dean Carnazes told that he, uh, uh, when he was doing ultras, ultra distance, uh, it happened to him that he fell asleep, and he woke up in the middle of the road with cars honking at him. You know, oh and so, so yeah, so he ran. He ran out of the sidewalk and into the road without falling. And then, yeah, wow. and, and kept running in the middle of the road. So I guess he would keep going. And, and, but, he was doing, but on that episode, he was doing like 120 miles. Um, wow. And I have uh, in other books, several people mentioned the, of, of how much they need a, a pacer. Uh, not in the beginning. Nobody needs a pacer in the beginning. You need a pacer after you have been on the road for eight hours, ten hours, or mm -hmm. overnight. The pacer is there to keep you alive. You yeah, know, he's not just just uh, setting up the, the the speed. He's making sure that you don't run into a hole. You know yeah. <laughs> that you don't fall. That that is a bridge you don't fall over the edge, or you know, or or things like that. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, sweep, sweeping the trail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he has to be, and then you need, uh, uh, you may need several uh, several fresh uh, uh, pacers. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's it's way too dangerous. Oh yeah. Well, the uh, like I said before, uh, I do every year. I I I I do a, I do a, an event where I lay. A bunch of pass trails all in a row. I am the hare and the, the hounds, they chase me. So I do that seven times in a row. Last year, in 2015, I did it in Portland, Oregon. This year, I'm going to do it in Chicago, Illinois. It'll be the first time that I've, I've actually been, uh, actually visited Chicago. It'll be the first time I've actually done hashing in Chicago. So I'm actually going to set a trail where I like, uh, and I have like the Chicago pack chase me. So that's probably uh, probably gonna that's gonna be my my highlight of, of 2016. Well, that and retiring from the military and uh, and then finishing my master's degree. So yeah, it's gonna be a big year for me. And uh, that I'm looking to do that in Chicago and, and sometime in September. So uh, yeah, that's gonna be kind of like the the my. My, I guess you could say it's kind of like it'll be my retirement party, <laughs> the closest <laughs> retirement party. Cool, cool. That that's awesome. Uh, uh, well, Rob, um, you have been one of the first people that joined uh, Voyagers World uh, as a supporter, as a pioneer, as an investor. You put money on it. You believed in in, in the idea, and so I would like to put here a big thank you. Uh, to you, uh, you know, it has been uh, a few key people that 
stepped up at that time, you know, in, in, in the beginning of it. Uh, now we have something to show for it. But at that time, it, it depended a lot on trusting me. And, and I wanted to thank you for that, uh, you know, and, and ask people to, uh, to join Voyager's World. Oh, thank you for yeah. having me. It's an honor, and you know, and I want to take you, invite people to participate. Uh, the system will be for free. Um, we are, uh, we have other ways that we can make money. So you know, you guys can use the website for free, and and, and I want people to to join in, participate, uh, send your suggestions and send your requests. Uh, and you know, and I am very happy to have you on this podcast. Uh, it's not the last one, but it's a it's 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 a great first one. All right, thanks everybody. See y'all. We hope you like this podcast as much as we like to produce it. This has been made possible by the efforts of dozens of volunteers, supporters, partners, and visionaries that are helping us build Forager's World. Please visit our website, join us for free, and start participating.